going on guys? Welcome to another episode of Tariq Radio. I am your gracious host, Tariq Nasheed. Glad to have everybody tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. Today's show is brought to you by BlackStarResumes.com. That's BlackStarResumes.com. You get 15% off if you mention Tariq Radio. That's BlackStarResume.com. Everybody come on in the room. We're going to chop up some good game. We're going to talk about the new Coming to America movie. We're going to do a review on that. We're going to break that down. So while y'all loading in the room, we're going to take that quick commercial break. So y'all do not move a muscle. We'll be right back. Right here on Tariq Radio. Listen up, squares. You need to get the legendary book on game. The Art of Mackin. By author Tariq King Flex Nasheed. Available on Amazon right now. Can you dig it? This book has been a bestseller for 20 years, Jack. And the New York Times called it a classic. That means it's out of sight. So this book ain't for no lames who ain't trying to learn the game. Jive turkeys. So if you're ready to stop slacking in your mackin', Get the Art of Mackin' book on Amazon and Barnes & Noble right now. Sucker. Rated PG. That stands for plenty of game. Jive chumps. Having problems finding employment. Employment. To provide for you and your family. Family. A candle is the perfect website for you. You're one click from your opportunities. So Jay. Starting a garden has never been so easy at this time. So check out MySeedsNow.com. With our 100% organic heirloom non-hybridized non-GMO seeds, we want everyone to be successful at growing their own organic gardens. We have culinary herbs, wildflower seeds, vegetables and fruit sampler packs all starting at just 99 cents. We even have sprouts and microgreens you can grow in the comfort of your home. Come join the fun and start growing your own organic food at MySeedsNow.com. Once again, that's MySeedsNow.com. Check out the three-volume book series, Kicked Out of Heaven, The Untold History of the White Races, by author Keenan Booker. This book series gives you details about the history and the mindset of European society, and it teaches you how that mindset affects us today. So go to kickedoutofheaven.com right now to get your copies of these important books. That's kickedoutofheaven.com. Are you tired of nerdy platforms that refuses to acknowledge white supremacy and geek culture? Do you seek a black nerd podcast that covers topics like anime, video games, movies, and TV shows, and other topics that black nerds can relate to? Then you need to check out the podcast, The Swarthy Nerd at SwarthyNerd.com. Join the host, the TV guru, and Yuki the Snowman every Tuesday on their mission to provide empowerment to black nerds everywhere. So that is SwarthyNerd.com. Swarthy is spelled... S-W-A-R-T-H-Y SwarthyNerd.com Black Star Survival A black-owned website providing outdoor urban survival gear for the black community. Black Star Survival also offers emergency preparedness kits, ammunition, firearms, and tactical gear aimed at helping the melanoid family prepare and protect themselves. Go to www.blackstarsurvival.com and follow us on Instagram at blackstar underscore survival. I took a Sub-Zero's Lifting the Fail IT Academy class. I doubled my income in, what, eight months? I got a job as an ETL developer with a company just outside of Sacramento, $50 an hour. In a couple of his courses and a couple of his classes with hands-on training, I wound up getting my first job making a little over 100000 a year. The, the skills that I've learned have been invaluable. Go to ltvacademy.com. That's ltvacademy.com. It's tax time again. Let the experts at Clark Pro Taxes make filing your taxes easy for you. They can prepare your taxes in person or virtually in all 50 states. 
Just snap a picture of your documents and leave the rest to them. Let Clark Pro Taxes prepare your personal and business taxes. Clark Pro Taxes will not stop until you get your maximum refund. Go to ClarkProTaxes.com now and schedule your free consultation with the owner, Victoria Clark. That's ClarkProTaxes.com. As the world fights this deadly virus, one of the best ways to stay safe is to build an immunity that can withstand every disease and ailment without the need for medicines or drugs. With proper exercise and nutrition, immune-boosting vitamins, and a smoothie recipe from HerbalOrganicProducts.com, you'll be ready for the fight. At HerbalOrganicProducts.com, you can download their ebook that details how to make vitamin-rich smoothies that will help you fight diseases and are absolutely delicious. You'll even learn about top herbs that can add a spark to your sex life. Check out Herbal organicproducts.com and place your order today. J-E-G-H-E-T-T-O-C-O-M Tell a friend to tell a friend The massive puppeteer in the game for 20 years First priority is the FBA community Docu puppetry, celebrate a black legacy Educate my people so my people can be free Virtual puppet shows, private parties and workshops Together, fighting white supremacy with hip-hop Check out online stores of handmade toys and more At Jaghetto.com, Jaghetto.com Have you been gaining a lot of weight since the COVID-19 pandemic? Ladies and gentlemen, do you have a weak upper body? Ladies, do you feel insecure when a man looks at you from behind because you feel like your butt isn't round enough? If you answer yes to any of these questions, Solomon's Fitness World can help you achieve your fitness goals. Solomon offers customized online personal training, makes and sells ankle, booty, and power resistance bands to strengthen, stretch, and tone your whole body. Order your resistance bands now at solomonsfitnessworld.com. Enter discount code TARIK to save 15% on your bundle order. www.solomonsfitnessworld.com Pre-order the first chapter of Becky. Shay had it all. A producer, a protector, a lifestyle. Until the blonde butcher returns. Getting rid of the other woman isn't as easy as it sounds. The first chapter, Becky, the graphic novel, is now available. Support now. Visit our website, gogetbecky.com, and join our email list for exclusive content. Are you tired of that ambiguous feeling of not knowing where you stand financially? You need to check out the monthly budgeting template from Financial Anatomy. This template allows you to categorize your money, manage your investments, assets, debts, liabilities, and your financial goals. The template is laid out in a way that all you need to do is add your monthly income, and you will know immediately where you stand. For a limited time, you can get this for free. Go to realmoneysuccess.com. That's realmoneysuccess.com. Use the code TYREEK2021 at checkout and get your monthly budgeting template for free. Bro, stop playing and start spraying. Leave a op on the ground where you stand. At all costs, yeah, make sure you protect it. Old goon juice, the formula been tested. You can defend yourself if you find that you need a little help. Gotta stay ready, ain't no love in the street. Pepper spray straight to the face, make them get weak. Get it at ogoonjuice.com. If they thinkin' you slippin', then tell them to come get them some. If you packin' this, you won't be lacking. A shot to the eye in them problems you have it. Maximal strip, hit them haters on ground. So you can feel free when you out in the town. Ogoon juice and don't forget a shirt, man. You gotta stay ready, that evil on lurk. Yeah. You are now tuning into the legendary Tariq Nasheed. I gave him the blood on that bridge and sell my On Tariq Radio. I said whoever threw that paper, your mom's a hoe. Oh, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. We are back. We are back. Glad to have y'all tuning in on this beautiful week, broadcasting live from Los Angeles, California. Did the show late this week, man. I've been a little sickly. You know, we start letting let my son Mateo start going back to, to school. The minute he goes back to school, he brings back one of the little school sicknesses because we ain't been sick all year. So he came back home with a little sniffle, then... The whole family got hit with the sniffles. We, we don't have the Rona, I don't think. We don't have the Rona, but we got the, the little sniffles and the coffee coughs. But I'm good, man. I'm, I'm doing what it do. I am doing what it do, ladies and gentlemen. 
And by the way, guys, the new website, the database, that's going that's already kind of up and running right now. We're just putting stuff in there. I'm going to break that down on Sunday's broadcast and reveal that and let everybody know how to report stuff to the the anti-black um, hate crime racism activities database because this is something that's definitely needed a lot of stuff going on out here man and we have to keep track of this stuff I mean uh, so many hate crimes against us are happening on a daily basis guys there was a video my, my sister Jay just sent me something where sister um, this was in Rochester New York I think a sister got pepper sprayed with her three year old I mean, the, the race soldiers are just doing all out attacks right now. They're normalizing just complete brutality of us. I saw a video, guys, down there in Plano, Texas, where there was a, there was a black kid who went to some kind of slumber party with some white kids, and they're racially abusing him. They're smacking him up, making him drink urine. And the Plano, Texas police, they're kind of dragging ass on this, talking about we got to investigate this, we got to investigate that. Let me tell you something. When black folks, if black folks does something, when they do something ratchet or whatever, there's no investigating. They just immediately go over there and start regulating. And this this black child who's being racially abused by these suspected white supremacists, and they're calling him all types of niggas. This it's a very sad video. And they're doing it and they're filming it because these white kids know. They know that when you commit a crime against a black person, you're going to be immune from the law. They know this. They know this. I heard, yeah, they were shooting him with a BB gun, the whole shebang. This is down in Texas. And what's interesting, down in Texas right now, boy, brothers are clapping up other brothers real quickly over every little thing. You, every other week you hear about a rapper down there getting shot up over something. You know, but when... The dominant society, when they do something that's that's a very vile crime, everybody acts confused. Yeah, when they start talking about they're going to do an investigation, that means they're going to protect the little suspected white supremacists who did it. And also, the media is already running interference for the suspected white supremacists. They're talking about it was a racial and a alleged homophobic attack. I'm like, where the hell are y'all getting homophobic out of this? Like, where in the hell did the homophobia thing come and see? When they do stuff like that, they're, they're already on code with each other. The name of the game is to minimize the anti-black part of the game and throw something else in there to muddy the waters. The white media... They're just being blatant with this type of stuff. The child, from what they're saying, he's 13. He looks way younger than that. They said he's 13. He looks way younger than that. And, and another thing black parents, and I'm assuming that he has a black parent. I don't know if, if there's a possibility of him, him being adopted by whites. I don't know. I don't know anything about the parents, but I'm just assuming. He has a black parent or black parents. Why in the hell would you let your black child have a slumber party at a house full of white people who nobody in the family is really related to or anything like that? Let, let's be very clear. We're in a very vile system of white supremacy. Black people, you don't let your black children spend the night at white people's homes like that. Now, some people will say, well, all white people are not bad. That's true. A lot of white people are not bad. There's some cases where the black child, they'll go to the white person's house and they might be safe for the night. There's a possibility. The problem is this. If that white person decides to do something to the black child, unfortunately, there's a system that's going to protect that white person. That's the problem right there. That is the problem. The problem is 
even if that white person did not want to be nice. See, they can choose to be nice or they can choose not to and nothing is going to happen to them either way. That is the problem. I want y'all to understand how racism works. They have a choice whether to be nice or not be nice. And the problem is there is no punishment for them if they ain't nice. That is the problem. The only person who's going to be disadvantaged is your child. So don't even take that risk. In this climate, don't take that damn risk. That's how you got to be. We got to stop playing games when it comes to these kids. I remember when the white supremacists tried to assassinate me in my home and the Asian newscaster came talking to me about how all cops ain't bad. She said, were the cops in there okay? Yeah, they were cool. And I asked the question, but what if they weren't? See, that's the problem. I'm not going to, I'm not giving you props for not shooting my ass. They shouldn't have been up here in the first place orchestrating this bullshit. And what if they were not cool? If they were not cool, they would still be safe. No matter what had happened when those race soldiers ran up in my house, pulling me and my kids out and my wife out at gunpoint, they would have still got to go home and they would have been protected by the white media and white supremacist society and the white supremacist judicial system. They would have been protected either way. We got to stop playing games when it comes to these kids. You're not in Kumbaya land, family. You're in a system of white supremacy where everybody's codified against you. See, black folks got to start wising up and stop this cowardly playing dumb thing because black people ain't dumb, all right? Black people are not dumb by a long shot. Black people play dumb as a form of cowardice when it comes to these white supremacists. And you don't put your children in danger like that. You do not put your babies in danger. You should have known better than to let your kid go to a slumber party with some white teens or any white kids. Hell, let alone play with them outside of school unless you're su you got to be supervising it. Even if you let them play with white kids, you better be supervising that shit. You better be sitting right there. Because, see, they have a green light to do whatever they want to do to you. Doesn't matter if they're nice or not. The problem is the or not part. They can choose not to be nice. They can choose not to be cordial and they'll still be protected. And that puts you at a disadvantage. We got to move smart out here. See, we got to understand how racial politics work. And that's why we're going to talk about the new movie coming to America. We're going to tie that in and so you can understand racial politics, especially when it comes to entertainment, when it comes to movies, when it comes to film. We have to understand racial politics when it comes to the entertainment industry. And by the way, the movie Buck Breaking is pretty much done. We're looking at a release for it next month. We're looking for April release. We're working on that now. We're just trying to you know, do all the, the mastering and all that stuff. But the film is pretty much done. We're just trying to plan on the release. Most likely the end of April is coming pretty soon. I'll keep you guys posted on that. You'll be the first to know. But this one is going to be a monster, as you already assume that is going to be. But let's talk about the movie Coming to America. This is the sequel to the 1988 hit movie coming to America the very popular movie a very culturally iconic film by Eddie Murphy with um, Arsenio and other people so they did a sequel to this 30 years later and the movie is on Amazon Prime the budget was like 60 million they sold it to Amazon Prime for 140 million I think something like that so, the movie streamed yesterday. Hope some of you guys saw it. Now, I'll say this. I was generally entertained by the movie, okay? Uh, there's pros and cons to the movie. There are pros and cons to the movie, 
okay? There are pros and cons. Number one, it, it doesn't come close to the original at all. It's not funny as the original at all. It's not. So don't even go into it thinking that. The thing is with this one, they could not be as edgy as they were in the first movie because of the time frame that we're in now. Right now, white supremacy is very vulnerable right now. So they look for any reason to deflect their bigotry onto black people, especially black people in the entertainment industry. So I want y'all to understand how the game works. So black men in particular in the entertainment industry, they have to walk on eggshells to a certain degree. So they cannot be edgy. They can't really be edgy like that and still get a pass in Hollywood. Because right now in Hollywood, the vultures are lurking. They're lurking around to put a black man on that sacrificial lamb cross to, to slice him up and dice him up. See, they're doing that to T.I. right now. The rapper T.I., they got T.I. There was a couple of women who came out, made some allegations. So now they got a Caribbean lawyer going after T.I. The, the, the white supremacist and put their Caribbean mammies and stuff already on him. They're going to start putting the Toronto Burks on him and all that stuff. So they're, they're giving T.I. The, the Me Too movement. But Cuomo and all these other high profile white people who are getting these allegations thrown at them. Shia LaBeouf, remember him? A very prominent sister had some allegations against him. They're not going at Shia LaBeouf. So, you know, they, they're going after T.I. So they look for any reason to start deflecting and attacking a black male in the industry because that's going to keep the eyes away from them and their anti-black bigotry. I want y'all to understand how the game works here. So with this coming to America, the problem with it was they could not be edgy with the comedy. Now, there are some pros in there. What I did like about the movie, I like the nostalgia. We got to see some of the characters, some of those old beloved characters, and we saw what happened to them. It was almost like a reunion show. You know, those are always fun. Like a show goes off the air and then all the characters come back and you see how they're looking now. There's always a fun type of nostalgic thing to that. So it was that vibe. We got to see a lot of those old beloved characters. Another thing, the black people were just beautiful. A lot of good looking black people in it. Just to see a lot of beautiful black people in a film. That's a great thing. I love that. Um, the costumes were phenomenal. There's a sister named Ruth E. Carter who did the costumes and hopefully she gets an Oscar or something. She did a great job with the outfits for the film. The outfits were phenomenal. And do y'all know they shot a lot of the movie down in Atlanta. They shot at Tyler Perry Studios and they shot at the rapper Rick Ross's house. A lot of that was Rick Ross's house down there in Atlanta. That used to be a Vander Holyfield's house. I used to go by there all the time because a couple of my buddies stayed over there. My dude, L.A. Snow, stayed right around the corner and a music producer named Tony Mercedes stayed on the other side of Evander Holyfield's house. So I know that area real well. That's a beautiful, Rick, Rouse, Rick Ross's spot is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful down there in Atlanta. So they put a lot of black folks to work down there. That was good. So stuff like that, those were some of the positives. Some of the, the guy who played the main actor, um, Prince Akeem's son, I think that brother's a pretty good actor. He's a pretty good actor. I think he's good. That brother has a lot of potential. It looked good. It looked real, real good. Everybody looked good. The women in there looked beautiful. Tiana Taylor, her body's incredible. Tiana Taylor's body's incredible. A lot of the sisters in there were beautiful, beautiful sisters. That was good to see. I like to see that. I love to see that. Yes, yeah, somebody say Rick Ross lives like that. Yes, he does. <laughs> yes. You can drive by Rick Ross's house down there in Atlanta, down there, um, a College Park. Yes. Yeah, Rick Ross, that, his house is huge. That, that land is huge down there. The rapper Rick Ross. Yes, that was Rick Ross's house. Yes, it was. 
But yeah, like I said, Tiana Taylor, bad, bad. But that sister's body is just so damn insane. She was beautiful in the film. So those were the positives. And another positive was Leslie Jones. Leslie Jones actually saved the movie. Leslie Jones, she was on Saturday Night Live. She was the funniest person in the movie. She was hilarious. She was hilarious in the movie. She saved the movie. Now, there was a couple of lazy edits in there. There was a scene where you could see um, Eddie's stunt double very clearly, and the stunt double don't look shit like him. Little stuff like that. But, but the issue was this. Like I said, it wasn't as funny as the first one because now they cannot be that edgy. And I, I saw that they were trying to be PG-13. See, the first Coming to America had a rated R. It was an R rating. This one, they were trying to kind of tone it down and just and, and be as lighthearted as possible. And it could have been more edgy to make it more funnier. But, but the thing is this, like I said, Eddie, unfortunately, Eddie Murphy has to walk on eggshells. Egg Eddie can't be that edgy comic he was in the 80s. He got away with it because you could get away with it because there weren't too many black comics like that doing it like Eddie. Eddie got his bones by being an edgy comic. That's what made Eddie Murphy Eddie Murphy. That comedy special he did on HBO, that was a classic. Very edgy. His comedy um, um, stand-up Raw, it was exactly what it was. It was Raw. It was very edgy. You talked about some very edgy stuff. I mean, you Eddie used to go in. A lot of folks don't remember. Eddie just went, he went on on everybody. He talked about everything. Dating women, banging women, talking about gay people, all that stuff, clowning some of them. He Everybody would get it. He can't do that now. In fact, they've been sending little warning shots to him about his old material from 30, 40 years ago. Like, hey, Eddie, remember when Eddie was doing all that homophobic stuff? They've been throwing little hints like, hey, Eddie, um, we, we see you. We want to keep you on your leash. So Eddie's been playing it safe. That's why Eddie's not really doing stand-up, and he shouldn't. I don't think Eddie should go back to doing stand-up because it's not going to work because he can't be edgy. Eddie cannot be edgy. He cannot be an edgy comic. They're going to look for anything to attack him with. The minute he gets out here and starts going in and being edgy, they're going to attack him. They're going to try to me to him. They're going to try to shame him and do the whole cancel culture thing. They're going to try to do all types of stuff to him. He can't be edgy. He can't do it. Because they're already waiting for him to slip up so they can undermine him. I think Eddie's been deliberately not doing edgy stuff so they won't have anything to criticize. He should leave that alone. That's why he has had the longevity he has had. Because he kind of started playing it safe. And unfortunately, you have to do that in a system of white supremacy. If you're going to be in their system, working with them, working among them. You, you understand? See, that's the, there's a pro and a con there. Now, I give Eddie his props on one thing. Eddie has helped out a lot of black people, and he doesn't have to go around saying, hey, look at what I'm doing, look at what I'm doing. Eddie's helped out a lot of black people. He kind of does it on the hush-hush. Remember, the first Coming to America movie was an all-black cast. They made him put a white person in there. He had to go get Louis Anderson, the comedian, to put him in there as a cast member. But it was an all-black cast. Eddie's been doing stuff like that on the low and you don't even catch it. One of my favorite movies is an Eddie Murphy movie and I've talked about this for many years, Boomerang, my all-time favorite movie. Phenomenal, 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 phenomenal movie. I can watch that movie a million times. Black romantic comedy, black people who are successful. It was a beautiful movie, loved it. One of my favorite movies, if not my all-time favorite. The entire cast in that was black and a lot of folks didn't catch that which was rare to show a bunch of upscale, sexy, young black people who were handling business in being romantic and funny. That was something unheard of in Hollywood. They got to have you buffooning and cooning. You see, Eddie Murphy's done a lot of fly shit, even with this movie. All black cast. A couple of white people sprinkled in there, but... He used the black studio to film it in, Tyler Perry. 
again, working with Rick Ross, put a lot of black actors in the game, gave a lot of thousands, I think about 6,000 people they employed. So I take my hat off to that. You understand? A lot of people got their start working on Eddie Murphy movies. Cuba was in the original, Cuba Gooding Jr. was in the original Coming to America. I think Damon Wayans got his career kicked off by being in Beverly Hills Cop. Chris Rock was in Beverly Hills Cop. I mean, Eddie put a lot of folks on. He put a lot of folks on. So the thing is, in this movie, they had the potential to do edgy stuff, but they, they just couldn't do it, not with the black males. And if you look at this movie, Eddie had black males in this movie who were ostracized by the white people, the white powers that be in the industry. He had our brother Wesley Snipes in it. Wesley was phenomenal. Wesley was funny in the movie. And they remember, Hollywood kind of shitted on Wesley. Hollywood kind of shitted on Wesley. And remember, Tracy Morgan. He had Tracy Morgan in it. Remember when they they tried to low-key spank Tracy Morgan for making a quote-unquote homophobic joke? Y'all remember that? Some of y'all forgot that. See, a lot of these black comics, they had to start sanitizing their work because they started getting criticized by the white industry right after... Old dude from Frasier, he got called out for, for getting on stage yelling nigga. They start doing the same thing to other black comics who were just doing comedy. When old dude from Frasier, not Frasier, but um, from Seinfeld. What's the guy's name from Seinfeld? Not for, the guy from the Seinfeld show, what's his name? Somebody in the chat room help me out. Yeah, Wesley Snipes was funny, and and he they also had him in the Dolomite movie that Eddie Murphy did. Kramer. Kramer. I get, yeah, Michael Richards, yes. When Michael Richards got called out, and he, he was made to go on an apology tour for getting on stage yelling nigga, they said, okay, we're going to start doing the same thing to black comics now. Because the white industry didn't like that. They didn't like that. You know, we made this dude go around apologizing left and right. Because, see, the name of the game, comedy, the stage is supposed to be sacred. You're supposed to say and do anything you want to do on the comedy stage. The thing with 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 Michael Richards, that wasn't comedy what he was doing. That wasn't when, when Michael Richards started yelling nigga, that wasn't even in the context of a joke. And the, the thing is, people were sitting there. It was a, a lot of black people sitting there. I think he was getting heckled or whatever and instead of having a catchy comeback he was just like hey shut up you're a nigger you're a nigger you're a nigger you're a nigger i would hang you you don't talk like way to a white man you're a nigger he was just and people were like okay man you better have a punchline and the punchline never came so that's why he got booed off and people got up and left yeah, that wasn't no joke. This nigga had a breakdown. There's a difference between somebody telling a damn joke and having a damn racist breakdown. Michael Richards had a white supremacist damn breakdown. Now, Tracy Morgan and these dudes were talking about, they were telling jokes. They were saying things in the context of jokes. And see, this is what they do to black people in the Hollywood game. If you want to be in the game, you know, they're, they're going to pull your car whenever they feel like it. They're going to reinterpret a joke and then flip it and use it against you and then dangle your career over your head and tell you, hey, if you want this career that we're giving you, you better act right. And just remember, we can yank this thing from you at any moment. So you better act right. That's what they did with Kevin Hart, too. You understand? So the thing is with Eddie Murphy, with this movie, he couldn't be edgy. And that killed a lot of the comedy. The thing is, in movies like this, in movies with black people, the black men cannot be edgy, but the black women can. This is another thing you'll see in Hollywood. 
the black women can be more edgy. They can be more raunchy. They can get away with saying a lot of stuff. Just like Girls Trip, the movie Girls Trip. Now that movie was very raunchy. They, they were doing all types of stuff in that movie that black men could not do in movies. Right now in this climate, black men cannot do big budget movies with the kind of jokes and the kind of slapstick and the kind of things they were doing. Like Jada and those guys were peeing on people. Um, Tiffany Haddish was doing blowjobs on fruit. See, they can get away with that stuff. See, Tiffany Haddish can get away with a lot of stuff. Yeah, white women too. White women can get real raunchy. And white men too, to be honest. White men can do a whole bunch of stuff in movies. The Ben Stillers and them dudes, they always doing dick jokes and anal jokes. And they always doing something with dick and anal. They always doing stuff like that. They can get away with that stuff. White people can get away with it. White women. Black dudes can't get away with that stuff. You cannot get away with it. Asians can get away with it too. What's that movie? Um, The Hangover, that Asian actor, he was running around with his little bitty dingling out. So you can do anything, but we got to walk on eggshells. Black folks got black men have to walk on eggshells. So that's why in this Coming to America movie, all the edgy stuff was given to Leslie Jones. She was the most edgy person in the movie. She was the one who got all the edgy stuff. All the edgy stuff was given to her. Now, look at the the original Coming to America. There were some things that were somewhat edgy in there, like when the scene where they were in the barbershop, the the original scene, and they were all in makeup. They were talking about white people. They were clowning white boxers. I don't think they would have gotten away with doing that now. They would talk, Rocky Marciano ain't shit. And all the white box, every time a white man come in here, you talk about boxing. So they were going in on white people in 1988. I think if they did that now, they would have had criticism. Eddie and Arsenio could not have went in on white people like that. You understand? They could not have done it. Another scene when they had in the original movie when they had the blick the miss black awareness contest and they had they were basically in church and they had all those fine sisters in there having the miss black awareness contest and they were in thongs in church they couldn't have done that because this movie the the recent movie they were talking about misogyny and how come a woman can't do this so it was it was already on some pc shit they were it, it already had some Me Too funk on it. You understand? Also, in the original movie, they had Sam Jackson. Remember, Sam Jackson had a scene where he robbed the McDowells. He went in there with a gun, shooting a, the gun, cursing everybody out. What the fuck you looking at, asshole? They couldn't have had that. That's too edgy. The royal penis joke that the joke when Eddie Murphy was getting washed by the chick and she got out the water naked and said the royal penis is clean. He couldn't have done that. Now, what's interesting in the new movie, there's a scene like that with Leslie Jones where she's in the water and a man comes up after, I guess we're assuming that he was doing something to her coochie. So she got to do all the edgy stuff that was done in the first movie. You you understand? There's a reason for this type of stuff. And remember Eric LaSalle's character, Daryl, he wasn't in there at all because the stuff he was doing was kind of edgy because he was, you know, clowning Prince Hakeem in the first movie. Remember in the first movie, he was talking about, man, how come you ain't over there chasing elephants and tigers and shit? So they didn't even have that character in the new film. You know? And yeah, and um, that was Sam Jackson's first role from what I understand. Well, he was really homeless at the time. Yeah. But that just lets you know that Eddie has to walk on eggshells and a lot of black people in Hollywood have to walk on eggshells. You can't really be edgy like that. And that's the problem with a lot of comedy now. It has to be watered down because 
those in the industry they will use the shit against you because see they'll make a they'll make the same amount of money attacking your ass they'll bill you up and make another hundred million dollars in donations tearing you right back down they're gonna make their money anyway so a lot of black male comics cannot be edgy the only big name black male comic right now who's edgy is dave chappelle like I said, with Kevin, Kevin can't be edgy like that no more. That was my criticism of his specials. That's why, you know, we were kind of going back and forth for a hot minute. Because Kevin, who's great, I'm not like Kevin. I don't dislike Kevin, but Kevin just, he's in the industry and they've already yanked his chain over some jokes he said years ago. So he has to walk on eggshells. That's why I said, my, I, I, I wasn't attacking our brother Kevin personally. I know how the game is. I understand how the game is. And that, uh, that affects your comedy. You got to water your stuff down. That's why Dave is like, oh, I'm going to do me. That's why Dave is like, I'm doing me. Dave is the funniest dude out here because he's edgy. He's on top of his game because he's edgy. And he's already told the industry, I don't need you. I do not need you. Shout out to Cat Williams. Cat Williams, you know, he's going through what he's going through. But Cat does his thing. He's still edgy and he does his thing. But I'm giving real props to Dave Chappelle. Dave is going to keep that thing rough, rugged, and raw. Which is how comedy is supposed to be. See, that makes you a revolutionary. You know, Dave don't give a damn. Dave is doing things on his own terms. And now, you know, he'll wait it out a little bit. And, they, and, and, and the industry starts getting some act right. They've been giving him his bag, you know, with these Netflix specials. And he got his show, the Dave Chappelle show on Netflix now. And they, they had to get his money right. See? That's how you do it. You go out here and let the people know, I'm going to deal directly with the audience. I'm not going to go through a middleman. I'm going to go out here and deal directly with the people. See, this is one reason why, and I want y'all to see something. This is one reason why they don't like to put on a lot of foundational black American entertainers. Because a person like Dave Chappelle who's the foundation of black American, you will connect with other people around the country. You're going to have a base. You know how to connect to your base. You're going to find your base. And when you connect to the people directly, you become very influential. I want y'all to understand that part of the game. When you connect with your people directly, you become very influential. This is why you notice a lot of rappers that come out now they make sure that they get rappers who are not foundational black Americans. Most, and I've talked about this before. Many rappers out here now, most of them are not foundational black Americans. Most of them immigrated from somewhere. Drake, Nicki Minaj. I mean, shit, 21 Savage, the list goes on. Kodak Black, a lot of them. There's a reason for that. Because they don't want they don't want black people being influenced positively by these artists as they were in the past. Remember, people, foundational black Americans like Melly Mel, he influenced the generation. Rock M, foundational black American, he influenced a generation. You understand? Nazir Jones, that's an influential rapper who drops knowledge. You understand? So they, they, Cardi B, that's another foreigner. See, they understand these foreigners are not going to feel a need to give positive information to their people, to foundation of black Americans, to the foundation of black American masses. They know that. Tupac, another foundation of black American. Tupac was going to reach his people and roll for his people and fight for his people. Tupac shot two cops for his people. Some cops were harming some black folks. Tupac got out and did something about it. They don't want people like that being elevated by the media. They don't want that. They know our spirit is different. Do you understand me? They know our spirit is different. It's 
it's natural for you to want to do something for the people from your lineage and you to use that influence. Michael Jackson, he was one of them. He used his influence to do stuff for the people. He comes from that lineage. They know we have a certain lineage. We speak to the anger of the people. Remember, Ice Cube and NWA, these are foundational black Americans. These guys spoke to the anger of black people here in Los Angeles. They were the soundtrack to the 92 riots that we had out here. You understand? Prince, foundational black American, he spoke to the people. Prince did not need the industry. The industry needed him. Prince, for a long time, he wasn't selling a lot of records, but he was still doing sold out tours all over the place. He knew how to go directly to the people. Because we're of this lineage, we know how to connect to our people. My movies, I have seven best-selling movies, did not go through the Hollywood system once. In fact, my movies has, have outsold the, the, the documentaries in Hollywood. I go directly to the people. This is why they demonize me in the media so much. I don't need them. You understand? I know how to deal directly with my people. I've been all over this country. I know my people. I know my lineage. You see, they've always tried to cause rifts between us because they know when we start connecting with each other, we're a problem. Chuck D, Foundation of Black American, connects with his people. He's going to give you some information what he did in the golden age of hip hop. The golden age was a lot of foundational black Americans influencing the culture and they've influenced the culture to this day. You look at people from 1988. 1988 was the most influential year of hip hop. That was the golden era of hip hop. Most of the artists were foundational black Americans putting out all these hot records at once. These records today are still influential. These people can still tour off these records today. You understand? And speaking of the riots, speaking of the LA riots, this was the anniversary for, you know, um, March 3rd was the anniversary the other day for the Rodney King beating when Rodney King got beaten. That was the anniversary. 30 years, guys. That's when Rodney King got beaten. 30 years ago, how time flies. Where were you 30 years ago? I remember like it was yesterday. Where were you when the LA riots were popping? Because I, I saw a lot of people talking about it online and a lot of people were like, I was eight years old. I was five years old. I'm like, damn, I feel old because I was out there in the mix. I was out there during the L.A. riots 30 years ago, man. How time flies. I, Man, I remember it like it was yesterday. One thing I noticed about the L.A. riots, see, the white supremacists hate admitting that they took an L and they took an L doing that riot. See, the white supremacists, they like to, at the end of the day, they look at body counts. They like to see how many whites died and how many black folks died. That's how they kind of take a toll on things. They always got to act like they won something. They won the battle, but they didn't. The white supremacists, they have a habit of lying about the numbers. See, the LA riots, when you start looking at the deaths what they would do, they would undercount the white people who got killed or assaulted. A lot of times they wouldn't even report it. I'm telling you from somebody who was out there, I saw white people getting that ass lit up. So I'm telling you, them numbers are not right that they're telling you. I saw some shit firsthand. Them numbers are not correct. They undercounted the white people and overcounted the black people. If you look at official numbers, they make it seem like like a lot of black people got harmed during the riot or because of the riot. And it almost made it seem like it was kind of equal. The problem was this, because again, I was out there. Nobody was really doing anything to black people like that. You better not have done anything to a black person. So what they do, 
Any black person who got killed or died during the week of the riot, they just tie it into the riot deaths. This is how they pad the numbers. I want y'all to research this. Look at the causes of death that they're saying these people suffered. There were black people who were getting killed in car accidents and they were saying that the car accident was related to the riot. It didn't make no sense. It was one sister who had a heart attack that week and they said she had a heart attack because of the stress of the riot. So they count that as a riot death. I mean, there were black people who were in like, who ran a red light and got hit by a car. They were counting that as a riot death. Any black person who died that week, they count that as a riot death. That's not correct. That's just them doing some I'm white and I say so stuff so they won't look like they, they took an L. The white supremacists are very good at that. When they take an L, they start lying about the numbers. They do a lot of that with the Seminole Wars down there in Florida. They're real good on that. There was a, something called the Battle of Okeechobee where they fought the Seminoles and the Black Seminoles and more white people got killed. The black people were outnumbered. It was only like 400, excuse me. It was only like 400 Seminoles. That, that's including the black ones and the red ones. But the black Seminoles were really the military force behind the Seminole Wars, by the way. And it was like a, shit, about a thousand white soldiers. It was about damn near 30 white soldiers died. Only about 11 Seminoles died and about 14 of them got wounded, but 26 or 30, it was it was something close to 30 white people got killed and 100 and something got wounded during the Battle of Okeechobee. But the white supremacists act like that was some kind of victory. It wasn't no victory. This is why, family, the next movie, I keep telling y'all about this next movie, we're gonna, we really have to talk about the black folks who are putting in work down in Florida. That's a story that has been undertold and not just undertold it's just it's been hidden they don't want you to get any kind of um, influence from that history they've lied about that history so much and they buried it the fact that black people were down there in Florida we don't understand black people don't really understand the severity of how much work the black people were down there in Florida putting in man Black people don't understand it. Somebody, I'm, I'm clearing my throat again. I'm still sickly, so y'all play past that. Don't trip on that. Somebody in there talking about, you need to stop drinking milk. Nigga. <laughs> but, like I said, down there in Florida. Down there in Florida. Yes, I'm still a little sickly. Albert, I told y'all that at the beginning of the show. I'm, I'm fine. It's all right. Y'all, y'all be all right. But down in Florida... A lot of folks don't understand that black people basically wiped slavery out in Florida. We don't know the severity of it. If you look at the South, a lot of the plantations, like in Alabama, there's still a lot of plantations still up. Alabama, they, they got dozens and dozens of plantations. Um, New Orleans, dozens and dozens of plantations. Mississippi, they still got standing plantations. South Carolina, just plantations all over the place. Um, Georgia, plantations all over the place. But Florida, there's about three slave plantations that's still up. <clears throat> it's about three plantations that's still up around that. And many of the plantations that's there now, which is only a handful, they're actually ruined. Because the Seminoles, the black Seminoles, basically went around and virtually wiped out all the plantations in Florida. A lot of folks don't know this. The black Seminoles were whooping ass so much, them brothers went around all over Florida, destroying virtually all the damn sugar plantations. Burning them down, killing the masters, freeing the black folks. All over the state. Google slave plantations or sugar plantations in Florida. You'll only see a bunch of ruins. They weren't playing down there. They weren't waiting. 
this narrative that we were waiting on white people to free us, fuck that, that's a lie. Brothers were out there freeing themselves. Brothers effectively, damn near neutralized slavery completely out of Florida on their own. Oh man, this is a story that's so gangster and it's not told, man. These brothers knew how to stall until the summertime because they understood down there in Florida is very tropical and that summer heat would decimate those white troops. They couldn't stand that summer heat and that swamp heat and the mosquitoes, they couldn't stand that. So they would stall and then draw them out in the summertime, they couldn't survive. Also, the brothers down there knew how to eat off the land. They would harvest that corn, they would jerk that beef down there and you can carry this food with you for a long time. They got something down there in Florida called Kunti um, root. Y'all know what the Kunti root? Where are my Florida people? They got something down there in Florida called Kunti root. These wild roots that these these plants that grow all around Florida, and you don't really need that much to to cultivate them, but you can use the root to actually make bread. So they make this kunti bread out there in Florida. So they would live off that kunti bread. So these people were so resourceful and they were whooping ass, they couldn't beat them. So they had to make a deal to get them out of there and send them to um, Oklahoma eventually and give them their freedom. They had to give them their freedom. We better understand who the hell we are and understand our damn history Shout out to Broward County. Yeah, they, they still feel a certain way about the black folks down there in Florida. The, you had some whoop ass black people in Florida, man. That's a story that's really undertold. I can't wait to start doing that movie. And speaking of movie, I saw a movie on Prime. Speaking of Amazon Prime, there's a movie, and I think it came out in 2018. And it's a movie with Ludacris. And it's the, the plot line is insane. It's called The Ride. And it's a, I love Ludacris, by the way. I love Luda. Love, Luda's a great actor, great rapper. Love Ludacris. But Luda clearly needed a check. I guess in between Fast and Furious, Luda had to get a check in this, in this movie. Luda's married to like a, a middle-aged white woman. That guy, okay. So they adopt a white kid who's a white supremacist. <laughs> Y'all got to look it up. I, I can't make this up, man. They adopt this white kid who's a white supremacist. He got like a swastika tattooed on his neck or some shit. And he's in juvenile. So Luda adopts the white boy and teaches him how to ride a bike. And he becomes a BMX champion and all. Okay. It's supposed to be based on a true story. I'm like, who, who, who? Okay. Who thought this would be a good idea? And the white boy they cast it, they cast for the movie, the grown ass white man. He's supposed to be a high school kid and he looks the same age as Ludacris. I'm like, what the, who cast this shit, man? Okay, Luda. Okay. Okay, just you're just trying to get that quick check, Luda. I ain't mad. I ain't mad, brother. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's called the ride. It's it, me and my wife were looking at each other like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Luda, brother. This is it's one of those movies. Hey, we can change. Uh, uh, black people can change the hearts of races. Oh, it's that liberal ass garbage. Just that type of thing. We got to change the racist heart of the, the white supremacists. Just give me a break. I'm cool on that. But fam, I saw something. There was a clip of some chick. I don't know who she is. They had her on this website. I don't know if she's supposed to be a, a, an up and coming rapper. Her name is Khalees something. I don't know who this chick is. And I don't know why some people give some of these folks platforms. I don't know exactly what she does. There's a lot of folks out here. I don't know what they do. But this chick is a Jamaican broad. And she's up here talking about black people, talking about our culture, Black Americans, Foundation of Black Americans. And y'all gonna have to, some of y'all foreign folks, y'all gonna have to get off the babbling and the bullshit 
because y'all just doing the most. Some of y'all are just babbling and being annoying with some of your bullshit at this point. But let me play this chick here because this mindset is kind of prevalent with so many people who are non-FBA. Now listen to this. Now it's 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 babble, but too many folks get into this kind of babble, and this enough is enough. Listen to this babble. Acting just like oh well, your black card is broke because you don't do this. You're black, and for me, it's just like. No disrespect to Americans, but it's just like African Americans are the least black people of black people, in my opinion. Just because it's just like culture wise, if it's just like, oh, black culture, black culture, American black culture is completely, I don't want to say completely different, but it's just like, what is it based on? Like, it's, pre it's pretty much just based on struggles that white people have forced on y'all that y'all just continue to perpetuate and it gets to a point where it's just like okay well if you don't do this then you're not black enough when in reality like okay okay she's like so black culture black american culture is based on the struggles that white supremacy put on us what do you think jamaica's culture is and this kills me about a lot of foreign negroes sit up here and act like their homeland isn't completely decimated by white supremacy to the point where you got to flee. This woman is doing the interview over here, by the way. Let's be clear. She's doing the interview over here. Don't don't come over here with the Wakanda talk like, oh, y'all struggling. Y'all y'all identity and culture is based on struggling. It ain't like us. Everything is. No, you don't live in goddamn Wakanda nor Zamunda. Your shit over there has been decimated by white supremacy and you had to flee. Y'all get off this dumb shit. Where y'all get all this goofball talk from? Pretty much just based on struggles that white people have forced on y'all that y'all just continue to perpetuate and it gets to a point where it's just like, okay, well, if you don't do this, then you're not black enough. When in reality, like, I speak about this a lot because growing up in Jamaica, a motto is literally out of many one people. Like... It's black people, it's white people, it's Chinese people, it's Italian people, it's all cultures, it's Spanish people, we all speak the same. Yeah. Does that mean that we don't have our specific cultures? No. The Chinese Jamaican is very, very proud of their Chinese culture, but they're also just as proud as their, of their Jamaican culture. Same mm -hmm. thing with white people. Talk just as much as me, but... And it's really no buts, it's really no difference, to be honest. So for me... Okay, okay. okay. <sighs> What is this fool talking about? Over there in Jamaica, the Chinese people, the white people, the Indian people are all on top of the black people there. They are all elevated over the black masses. There is no kumbaya. There's not, there's not this big one love Bob Marley type of vibe. It ain't. Okay, I've been all over Jamaica. It ain't. All these other people are on top of the black people there. It ain't some big old happy melting pot. That's what she's trying to elude, that there's some kind of big multicultural, multiracial melting pot, talking about the Chinese are just as proud of their Jamaican side. No, they're not. Though They come over there to exploit resources. That's the difference between y'all and foundational black Americans. They come over and decimate your damn society and y'all sit there making excuses for them and y'all come over looking for another damn Asian or white zaddy. We know what they're capable of, so we warn each other about them. While y'all niggas come over here criticizing us. Well, y'all culture, y'all going at the white folks and Asian people. All white people ain't bad. It's that type of shit. I feel like the box is placed on everybody. It's just like, okay, just because you're black doesn't mean you have to speak in Ebonics. I know a lot of black people who don't know how to at all. Like, at, like really at all. Like, could barely, like, almost, like, would sound like a white person asking, like, oh, what does that mean? And in the same way, I know... A what is she talking about? Black people and Ebonics. These are Negroes, again. This is why, remember... <sighs> Kamala Harris, her family, that's that Kamala Harris. These, these folks are black when it's convenient. They look at themselves as a whole different ethnic group, guys. This is These are these goofy-ass conversations folks like this have in their homes all the time. We look at them, oh, that's just another black person. They see themselves as something else, 
and they get the babbling and talking crazy. And this is the problem to us. We know it's babble. But the problem is white people use this babbling type of Negro against us. White people are like, okay, look, I don't want to hear this nigga's babble. All I know is this nigga's confused and this nigga hates other foundational black Americans. This is going to be a perfect tool for me. That's what white supremacists see when they see a babbling Negro like this. We look at this person like, okay, this Negro is just babbling like crazy. White people look at it like, okay, I just found the next leader of Black Lives Matter Brooklyn. You understand? These are the people they elevate. This is going to be the person they have at the reparations hearing. Oh, this is a useful idiot to the white supremacist. Some white people that sound more Jamaican than a lot of like black people you would see like, oh, that person looks Jamaican versus that person was just like, oh no. So definitely feel like within the whole community, because I feel like in the same way how black men are just kind of like, oh, oh, those guys are pretty much just like, oh, like, you know, black women always do this and the third, or they're always like on me and always doing this and the third. In the same way, definitely like i feel like it's a lot of black women. Uh, okay i don't know I, the, the, the last part just completely lost me it just went into just massive babbling okay okay so yeah the last part she's just babbling at this point i don't know what she's talking about but this is the thing so sound like she's high on weed and sometimes you know the folks get high and they start telling how they really feel but then they kind of try to cover it up but then that just makes them babble more She's telling how she feels and then she's trying to backtrack and babble, but she can't articulate her babbling. You ding? But this clown ass talk, I, we don't have time for it. We don't have time for this time wasting clown talk. We just don't have time for it. We don't have time. Talking about Ebonics and all that. What? Patois is a form of Ebonics. That's basically broken English. Yeah, you can't fake Ebonics. So look, I'm, I'm tired of folks coming over talking about our culture. Foundational black Americans are the culture of this land. These other groups, if you had to flee from your joint, you ain't really got no culture. Because your culture was so bad, you had to flee it. I don't let anybody come over here talking about who got a damn culture and who doesn't. We are the only group who did not flee from our culture. We've been 10 toes down for thousands of years on this land. We are the culture of this land. And our culture, for the most part, all of it is not even told. But no, you don't get to flee especially if you come from a failed culture and come over here running your mouth to a foundational black American about a damn thing. You better just sit here and enjoy the food and shut the hell up and eat and be merry and don't try to undermine us. So we're going to have to start regulating people who try to undermine us. See, that's the problem. So you can't go to other countries and start undermining the people when they're trying to fight against oppressive powers. See, we let these folks come around, come among us and just say and do anything. We gotta start nipping that stuff in the bud. Let's go back to the Seminole War down there. When the black people were going around, the black and the red people were going around hitting all those plantations, and killing the slave owners and taking cattle, because that's another thing they were doing. They were taking all the cattle and taking all that money and their resources. They were hitting all those plantations in Florida. Understand, there were some coons too. They were freeing all the black people and they were freeing them by force. Some of them said, hey, you better come with us. When they were hitting those plantations, they were like, no, you coming with us right now. Now understand, when you look at some of the historic records, there were some black folks who wanted to coon it up. Oh, Lord, y'all niggas done going crazy. Leave these master alone. Okay, you gonna die right here with them too. So you would hear stories about 
the black Seminoles down there killing white slave owners and a couple of house niggas. You would hear a few stories like that. Some niggas wanted to be loyal and stay there with Massa until the end. Well, nigga, you're going to die to the end. You're going with them. Because this is a ride or die mission right now. If we come over here, you better ride or you're going to die. That was the mission of the Seminoles. You going to ride or die, nigga. No coons left behind. They went on a no coons left behind mission in Florida. They don't tell you this about the history. It was a no coons left behind. You better ride or die. You're going to die right here cooning. Cooning is going to, you're going to have one last butter biscuit before you die. You're going to die right here if you ain't rolling. You better pick up this gun. You better kill your master or we going to kill him and you. Now you make a choice, nigga. Put your, your, your war boots on or your tap shoes on and you're going to die in them tap shoes. Weez got shot, Massa. Oh, Lord. So trust and believe. You had some niggas out there who didn't want to be free. You had niggas out there trying to cop a plea. No, it don't work like that. When when the revolutionaries are, 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 are taking over, ain't nobody to cop a plea to. That's why Coons always trying to undermine niggas. Oh, it wasn't none of that. Oh, Lord, we got to stop. We need the gospel. Oh, we need the gospel. We need prayer. They're, these Negroes are killing white people. They're killing cops. They're killing people. We, Bam. No, nigga. No, no, no. No crying. Ain't no crying and begging, nigga. You gonna die. No coons left behind. <laughs> you understand? They weren't playing that game down there. Anyway, y'all. I, I can't wait till we do that movie. We're doing that movie. That's going to be my very next movie. We're just trying to look for locations to film it. That's going to be the very next movie. And summertime is coming, so we're going to have a great time filming that for the summer. I cannot wait to film that movie. We're just trying to um, get everything together. But that's going to be the next movie, man. It's going to be a monster. But anyway, man, let me get up out of here. It's been real. But again, go see the movie, man. Go see um, Coming to America, man. It's a good nostalgic watch. Go check it out. And again, Buck Breaking is coming soon. Go to buckbreakingmovie.com to get details. Again, we're looking at the release next month. 